Good morning. Today's scripture reading is going to be from Genesis 1. Genesis 1, and we're going to read verses 24 to 28. Then God said, let the earth bring forth living creature according to its kind, cattle and creeping thing and beast of the earth, each according to its kind, and it was so. And God made the beast of the earth according to its kind, cattle according to its kind, and everything that creeps on the earth according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And then God said, let us make men in our own image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. I count it a privilege to open up the word of God uh, here with you this morning. I don't take this uh, lightly. I stand here only by the grace of God, and uh, I'm excited to see what he has in store for us. I do see the clock and know that it's quarter to 12 already. I see that. So I'll try to cut out a few things where I can and, and, and get us out of here by at least one. Uh, so we'll see how that goes. Today, uh, kind of going off of some things that we've learned as college and career, uh, in the last two months or so, we've been going through a series by Pastor Matt Chandler called A Beautiful Design. And uh, it's getting back to, uh, you know, who our designer is. We know that's our creator, God, uh, why he's created us, how he's designed us in unique ways, you know, male and female, and, and getting into that. Uh, tonight, actually, is kind of going off of that. We're going to talk about uh, men and, and women, their uh, specific roles and how God has specifically designed uh, the two genders and, and, and how that works and some things that men and women may typically struggle with, uh, some things that uh, we're to overcome. We're going to look at how Christ is our, our redeemer and makes, makes these things right. So uh, I'd love to see all of you back out here uh, tonight uh, as we dive in a little deeper into uh, the purpose that God has intended for us and manhood and, and womanhood and all that good stuff. So today we're going to talk a little bit about purpose, design, meaning, value, worth, identity, as it relates to being created in the image of God. Okay, so the imago Dei, right? That's Hebrew for image of God. I'm sure that we've glanced through that verse before in Genesis 1, uh, right? Verse uh, 27 says, you know, God created man in his own image. And maybe we haven't really dove into that or understood that. So that's kind of our purpose here this morning. We're going to unpack that a little bit and what that means for us to be created in the image of God and how that changes how we are to treat others when we truly see them as made in the image of God. So let's just take a, a quick uh, moment here and, and I'll have a word of prayer uh, before we uh, get into our points here this morning. Father God, uh, what a privilege we have to meet here as brothers and sisters in Christ, as family, as friends, Lord, to worship you. I thank you for the songs that were selected this morning and how they were centered on you, uh, Lord, how we focused on, on your goodness, your sacrifice for us. And Lord, as that last song said, we, we want you to speak this morning. God, may these not be words of my flesh, Lord, but may your spirit uh, just lead us as we look into these verses. Uh, God, may, may you truly speak to hearts. That's your work, God. I can't change anyone here, but your spirit has the power to, to work miracles, uh, and to make uh, dead hearts come alive, Lord, to change and transform a person's soul. Uh, so, Lord, I leave that work to you, and I ask that you would honor yourself here this morning. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. So, a few things we're going to look at this morning. Who designed us? For what purpose? Uh, believe me, the world today is giving us a lot of wrong advice about where we came from and what we're here for, uh, confusion over, over gender and all these things. I mean, 
I'm sure you've seen in the news the, the Bruce Jenner thing and, and wanting to be a, a lady, and there's just a lot of confusion out there in the world today. But I tell you that God never got it wrong uh, back in the beginning. Let's get back to plan A, and we'll look at God's design for us, how he has created us, and he's created us for a purpose and to be on purpose. So uh, point number one, just simply in the beginning. So uh, Genesis 1.1, very familiar verse, first verse in the canon of scripture here. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God spoke all things into existence using nothing. God needed absolutely nothing or no one to do what he did. He just spoke the universe into existence. Uh, That includes everything here on earth and you and I. You see, design in the world around us screams there's a designer, right? Because we have design and order, That says that there is a designer behind it all, that there is somebody who has ordered and orchestrated those things, right? Take take my phone, for an example. I mean, if you, everything that, and I'm not very techie, but there's a lot of crazy stuff that has to go on in here to make this thing work, right? This piece of whatever it is, plastic and broken plastic, as you see from the screen, right? And, And if you took everything that needed to be present to have a working phone, if you took all the, the little pieces, right, nuts and bolts, though I don't know if there are really any nuts and bolts on this phone, maybe in my head, right? But, uh, you know, the screen and, and all the software that goes behind it and, and the design, if you put all those things it takes to make up a phone, you throw them in a box and wait for a trillion years maybe, you'd get a working phone? Is that how it, is that how it goes? Is that how the designers of phones do it? No, there, there is, there's uh, intention behind that. There is intelligent uh, design, right, to make this thing function. Okay, so now I, I do have a working phone. I know it's cracked, but so what's the purpose for this thing? I mean, I love hockey, so are we going to go on the ice and, and use this as a puck, or maybe it's to comb our hair? Is that what phones are for? You know, what are these designed for? No, they're designed to stay in touch with people. You're texting, calling, emailing, uh, surfing the web, uh, playing fun games. I know that's what Ron McLeod does on his phone. He's all about can- Candy Crush, you know, but uh, I'm just joking. Uh, so this is designed for a certain purpose, okay? If we were to try to use it as a hammer or a comb or a hockey puck, it's not going to work that well. It's not what it was made for. Um, it'd be like the same as saying, uh, you know, Gary to one of his, his children, I've got two tasks for you. Okay, I need you to wash the dishes and I need you to, uh, to, to build something here for me. And he gives them two tools, right? I know his, his children, they're fairly intelligent, right? They're, they're not going to take the hammer and try to scrub the fine china with it and, and clean uh, the, the glasses. No, they're not going to do that. They're going to take the sponge. That's what it has been designed for. And the other side of things, they're not going to take this sponge and try to put together a birdhouse. And try, you, you would be very frustrated because you're not using these tools for how they were designed. And I think so often there are people that are living their lives not on purpose, not for how they've been designed to live. And that goes into uh, gender confusion and, and all these other things. And, you know, am I to be famous and make a lot of money in this life? Is that what God's purpose is for me? And, and if we're not living our lives on purpose and for why we've been designed, there will be a lot of frustration, right? There's going to be a lot of confusion, Uh, Just like if you were to try to hammer a nail with a sponge, you're going to get frustrated, right? You're going to get angry. It's just not going to work, okay? So I just want to share with you, and you don't have to turn there. I'd encourage you to stay in Genesis chapter 1. But in Colossians chapter 1, one of my favorite verses here because it's just so simple and and so uh, complex at the same time. And if we just centered our lives around this, I think, Uh, there would be a lot more meaning and purpose to our lives. Verse 16 of Colossians 1 says this, For by him all things were created, that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. I love this line here. All things were created through him and what? For him. That includes us. We have been created 
by God and for him. So what does that mean? Well, it's, it's, it's speaking to uh, his glory. We have been created by him to image him, and we're going to get into that a bit as we talk about what it means to be created in the image of God. We are created to bring him glory, right? He doesn't want us to live our lives so others are always patting us on the back and, and uh, giving us credit. We are to uh, reflect that credit to him because he's the one that created us. He is the one that has uh, given me life. He's the one that given me the ability to even get up and walk this morning. He's the one that has given us the ability to, to go to work or to school, etc. And then just over a couple chapters in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 23, it says this, And whatever you do, do it heartily as unto the Lord and not to men. You see, we need to be giving glory to him. He is the one that we're to rely on. We are to bounce credit that comes at ourselves, bounce it to him, and give him the honor and the glory for all things. So God has created you and designed you with a specific purpose in mind, and that is to bring him glory. You don't have to be in ministry to do this, right? You, you're just at school, or maybe you're a parent at home caring for your children. You're in the workplace. You're always, doesn't matter what God has you doing, you're always to be pointing others to him, giving credit to him, saying, I can't do this on my own. I can't be a good co-worker without the grace of God. I can't parent my children or grandparent my grandkids if it were not for the strength of the Lord, right? Christ is the one that's, that's holding your family together. Christ is the one that's giving you the ability to, to go into your school, maybe a public school, and stand up for him. All the credit must go to him. So if we're not living with this purpose in mind, you, you may have a lot of uh, frustration, uh, some heartache, and a lack of joy in your life. So at our core, we need to know that we have been created by God and for God. I actually uh, was, was talking to a young lady once uh, who was contemplating suicide, just a, a young teenager, and uh, she was sharing a little bit of her story with me. And uh, she shared that, uh, well, for one, her parents didn't plan on having her. And so that, has haunt, that was haunting her uh, throughout her life. She would also go to a public school where they'd be teaching that, well, you just happen to, to be here. You know, the evolutionary thought is like things are just random. There's no purpose or design, and we're just here by chance. So if a young person is, is, is hearing those things and, and thinking they're just an accident or a mistake and that there's not a, a God behind it all that has created them, then, yes, that may lead to uh, frustration and depression that would cause somebody to have those kind of thoughts. And so I was reassuring her and going to Psalms uh, 139 and others that God has formed you in your mother's womb. There is purpose. God has created you. You're not some product of some evolutionary chain of, of, of thought and, and that theory. It's very important that we know we've been created by God and for him. Secondly, we have not just been created by God, but we've been created in his image. Okay, so here we see in the passage that uh, Adam read for us, God says, let us make man in our image. Now, why would God speak like that? All right, he's not schizophrenic, right? Why would he say, let us make man in our own image? You see, the triune God, the three persons of of, of the Trinity, we're, we're having this conversation and, and let us, right? So all three persons of the Godhead were a part of creation, right? So he's saying, let us make man in our image. Verse 27, so God created man in his own image, in the image of God, he created them, him, male and female, he created them. So again, image of God, the imago Dei, nothing else in creation, has been created in the image of God, only us, okay? So that sets us far above any other of God's creation. Trees, plants, the oceans, sea creatures, little insects, animals, created in the image of God? No, not created in the image of God. Only human beings have been created in the image of God. Uh, John MacArthur speaking to this says, says this, uh, this defines man's unique relation to God 
Man is a living being capable of embodying God's communicable attributes. In his relation, uh, in his rational life, he was like God in that he could reason and had intellect, will, emotion. And in the moral sense, he was like God because he was good and sinless. This is, of course, before the fall of man. So we are far more valuable than any kind of animal or any other of God's creations. Now, some people do not believe this. An example of that, I had, I knew some people in high school that they went and protested some, uh, some event that uh, a Bowwater sawmill was having on. So I grew up in my teenage years working at a sawmill in Bridgewater, and they were having some demonstration out in the woods, and, and there was some uh, uh, hippie type high school people that went out there and they're protesting, don't you cut down those trees and like save the world. And I'm pretty sure they live in houses made by wood, so it's kind of ironic. But, uh, so, but these were the same kind of people that are saying, oh, protect the trees. They were the same kind of people that would be on the front lines of a pro-choice movement. And they would say, you know, abortion's okay, the woman's right. The same kind of people. And so what they've done is they've messed up this idea of humans being created in the image of God. Where they've elevated, it's, it, we've got to take care of the animals more than unborn babies. Or, or let's, let's hug those trees and keep those safe. And who cares about these infants in the womb? It's messed up, and it goes against God's design for humans. You see, it would be far worse for anything to happen to a human, right, than anything else created by God. We have an elevated worth. So we humans have eternal souls, right? Nothing else created does. Give you the example of my cats. I think I have a flip to the next slide there. Uh, my boys, my boys, Harry and Lloyd, they're cuties. They're brothers. Yeah, uh, they're great. But they don't have eternal souls. Pretty sure they're probably at home right now just sleeping, not giving a care about anything. They're not, you know, wrestling over spiritual things. They're not seeking to worship God. I mean, they're not worried about the salvation of their loved ones. That's, that's not happening, right? They, they haven't been created in the image of God. Yeah, they're great. And maybe you don't like cats. Maybe you're more of a dog person. I understand that. We can still be friends. That's fine. But these creatures do not have eternal souls. These cats, as cute as they are, are not created in the image of God. But folks, you and I are. We have an elevated worth and values. Humans have been created on purpose by a perfect God and have been made in his image. Takes us to our next point. A broken and restored image. Let's just turn over to Genesis 3. I just want to read a couple verses for you here. Genesis 3, verses 6 and 7. Speaking about the fall of man when sin entered the world. Verse 6, so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to her eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together to make themselves coverings. We're going to dive a little deeper into this passage tonight, so come on back tonight, 6 o'clock. And what that means uh, for, for men and women. But something happened here. When sin entered the world, it shattered our relationship with God, broken that relationship with God, and shattered our ability to perfectly reflect the image of God. So that that mirror that God had given us, we as humans are to reflect the image of God. We are to to try to demonstrate some of his characteristics in in love and being gracious and, and merciful and living those out, reflect people to God who is perfect in all these things. That image, that mirror has been shattered, okay? We cannot perfectly uh, show others the image of God. I just want to read a bit of a commentary uh, for you on this passage. Uh, Again, it's just uh, here uh, in in the first chapter of of Genesis, uh, some commentary on verses 26 and 27. The pinnacle of creation is humanity. Humans 
are made in the image of God. They therefore have life that is sacred, and they are to resemble God in character, speech and actions, so that they might have relationships of fellowship and worship with him and with one another. Their calling was, in short, to be fruitful so that the glory and goodness of God would multiply through them. That is, they were to be agents of God's dominion on earth, and the blessing of fruitfulness would enable them to fill the earth with God's image bearers. As God's kingdom extends to the whole world, so his rule was to extend to every corner of the earth by his direct influence and by his image bearers, which uh, we are privileged to be. People, however, failed by their sin, corruption, and and rebelliousness to fulfill their image-bearing responsibilities. Folks, we're all related to Adam. We've all sinned. We've all fallen short. We've all shattered this mirror that uh, is meant to reflect others uh, to the image of God. So sin's broken that relationship with God. And we fail to be God's image bearers when we do sin. We paint a poor picture to the world around us of who God really is. But again, as we spoke in communion, God had a plan all along. God had a plan. So God in love planned a way to make this right. Through the suffering and death of his dear son, the Lord Jesus, Christ came and died in our place so that if we would turn from our sins and trust our Savior, our broken souls could be mended back together again. And that relationship with a holy God restored. And just finishing uh, reading this commentary on this passage, it says this, Yet the Lord renewed the mandate of fruitful multiplication to Noah and to Abraham. He similarly blessed Israel and promised to bless her as she humbly obeyed. Yet again and again, Israel failed. Jesus, however, Jesus Christ, as the second Adam, fulfills God's image-bearing purposes and enables God's people to do the same. The Apostle Paul speaks of the light of the gospel, of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Jesus is the image of God we are intended to be. And as we are united to him by faith, God sees us, his children, clothed in righteousness, in the righteousness of his son, to whom we are conformed in the righteousness, in righteousness and holiness. So Jesus was the one that has come to restore that broken image, to, to mend back together that mirror of our lives that is meant to reflect others to the glory of God, to be his image bearers. So Christians, there is hope for us in our inability to reflect the image of God. He's at work in you to sanctify you, to make you more like Christ and put back that broken mirror piece by piece. This is his work of sanctification. And there is coming a day when we'll be like Christ and we will fail no more to reflect the image of God. Okay? So God is doing that work in you. If you're a Christian here this morning, right, sin has shattered that, uh, that mirror in your life that's to reflect others and be that image of God to the world, but God is at work in you to restore that, and one day we will be just like Christ, and we'll be able to reflect his, the image of God perfectly. So uh, let's get practical here, okay? We're going to shift. Uh, point number four uh, is the Imago Dei, so the image of God, and how I view myself. So the Imago Dei and how I view myself. Uh, I remember one of our Bible school teachers, I think it was Mr. McMahon, uh, was talking about how a lot of people live their lives maybe with their nose up in the air, right? They're very prideful and they think they're all that or whatever. And then there's the other side of things where people are, oh, woe is me. My nose is always down and, and, and depressed and, and don't have a, a good, healthy self-image of themselves. He likened it to a plane coming in for landing. I mean, you don't want to be on a plane that's coming in nose first. It's not going to work. The nose down, right? And you don't want to be on a plane that has the nose way up in the air. It's got to come in nice and flat. And I think that we need to have a good, healthy view of ourselves. Not too high, not too low. Okay? So many of us uh, 
may struggle to have a healthy view of ourselves. But knowing that you've been created in the image of God is going to help with this. It's going to change this for you. Many may struggle with self-esteem issues, body image, identity, meaning and purpose in life, uh, things like that. But a failure to know that you are loved and valued by God will result in these issues. That's why theology is so important. It's so important. Knowing how God views you. you know, getting into the word of God and seeing that, wow, I have been created by, by God himself. And, and I've been designed a certain way and to be on purpose. And, and I've actually been created in his image. Wow. That, that speaks to your value and to your worth. And that he, he truly loves and cares for you if you're one of his. So we must correct this view of ourselves in the light of knowing we've been created in the image of God. We have great value and worth before him. I'm just going to read. You don't have to turn there. But again, Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 6 and 7. I alluded to this during communion. It says, uh, the Lord speaking about his people, the Israelites, and, and this includes us, if we know the Lord. He says here, for you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for himself, a special treasure above all the peoples on the face of the earth. Right, a special treasure. Verse 7 says, the Lord did not set his love on you, nor choose you because you were more in number than any other people, for you were the least of all peoples. Right, and we see in Romans 5, verse 8, God demonstrates his own love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That speaks to your value. He loved you so much that it had moved him to crucify his own son, to provide a way to restore a relationship with him. That's the beauty of the gospel. And in Psalms 8, verse 4, what is man that you are mindful of him, and that the son of man, and the son of man that you would care for him? Who are we that God himself, the designer of all, would, would care that much for us and value us that highly? You see, if the God of the universe would slaughter his own son, pour out his righteous anger on his beloved for you, doesn't this speak to your value and to your worth? Maybe you've got a wrong view or an unhealthy view of yourself. Because you've heard all too often the voice of others around you speaking unkind words to you, maybe words of hate, maybe words that are taking you down and devaluing you. That's out there. Maybe that's been us before speaking those words. But may the voice of God saying, I crucified my own son for you, may that drown out any other kind of voices out there that are speaking negatively to you. What are you listening to? Uh, way too many people are listening to those devaluing voices out there, and they're getting really down on themselves, and their, their heads down, their noses down. But don't listen to that. Listen to the voice of God saying that you are worth the death of my own son. That speaks to your great value. So if your view of yourself in relation to the image of God is off, if it's pridefully high, or if it's depressingly low, Work at straightening that out by the grace and strength of God. Fifthly, the image, or uh, yeah, being made in the image of God or the imago Dei and how I view others. Okay, so point number five. Almost done here. The image of God and how I view others. So speaking about those devaluing voices we did in the last point uh, that I mentioned, maybe those voices have been your own. Maybe you have been speaking unkind, hateful words to those around you. Maybe even family, maybe friends, co-workers. Maybe you've been speaking down about them, or maybe you've thought these thoughts. I'm sure we've all been there before. I'd raise my hand, yes. I have failed to see people at times as being created in the image of God and having value and worth. So maybe that's you. I think we've all been there. But again, we must come back to the reality that God has created all in his image. That must be at the forefront of our minds. And a failure to see this has terrifying results. Think of some of the biggest issues in our world today. Okay, slavery, human trafficking, abortion, pornography, racism, suicide, murder, and so on and so on. 
You see, if everyone truly believed that all humans were made in the image of God, this would get rid of these problems. It would rid the world of these crazy issues that are happening around us. Not seeing others as they truly are, as created in the image of God, has led to some of the most uh, tragic uh, things in our world today. You know, there are about 27 million people in the world today that are slaves, against their will, caught up in modern-day slavery, about 27 million worldwide. You think of the terror around the Holocaust, uh, the sex industry, so prostitution, pornography, sex trade, things like that. There's an estimated 1.4 million people that are trapped in that today. An industry that generates over $30 billion a year. A failure to see people made in the image of God. What about the murder of, seven, or of, of about 50 million unborn babies in the U.S. alone in the last 40 years? That's a failure to see these unborn children as made in the image of God. Euthanasia, racism, abuse of all different kinds, again, at its core, it is a problem of not seeing people created in the image of God. So all this sick sin and darkness, I believe, would vanish if everyone treated others as created in the image of God. So how can we change all this, right? You, you hear the stats of, well, what can I do for 27 million people in the world that are caught up in slavery? Like, that, the task is too big. I, what, what can I do in that? I mean, the abortion issue and, and so on and so on. Well, it can start with us, with those around us, your family, your friends, your neighbors, your coworkers. Let's start treating them with value, knowing that they too have been created in the image of God. And then lastly, why care about the Imago Dei, right? Why care about being made in the image of God? And why care about seeing others as made in the image of God? Uh, you don't have to turn there. You can if you want. Just a couple verses in Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5, verses 1 and 2 says this. Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children. And walk in love as Christ also uh, loved us and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. Be imitators of God. See, if you're a child of God, you've been bought and redeemed, and, and you have been adopted into his family, and one of our purposes is to, to live in such a way that imitates God so that we will reflect to those around us who God really is. I mean, we are to be his image bearers as created in the image of God we're to show people uh, what God is like, okay? We need to paint an accurate picture as Christians, as children of God, of who our Heavenly Father is. So, for example, let's take the purpose or, or the command of God to unconditionally love people. I mean, that's a task that we cannot do on our own. We need the grace of God to, to attempt that, right? So, unconditionally loving people. So, for, for me or any of you here that are trying to unconditionally love others, that's great. But, but why, why do that? You see, it doesn't end with you, okay? So, so if you had the uh, uh, ability, so we'll pick on Adam. This is a friend of mine, Adam, at, at work. Uh, maybe there's somebody there that rubs in the wrong way, and but he's like, no, I need to, to love this person and show Christ to them. The purpose for him unconditionally loving, trying to love a coworker, doesn't end with him. It's not so people around it can be like, Adam is so amazing. Wow. What a great guy. He, the, he can show love to this person that rubs him the wrong way, that maybe mistreats him. No, it doesn't end with Adam. Adam does that to reflect others to God, who is the author and perfecter of unconditional love. It doesn't end with you. It's part of why we need to give glory and credit to God. So the command to forgive others. Yes, that's good. We need to forgive others. And it's not so we can say, hey, I'm an amazing forgiver and like pat me on the back and wow, you're so great at forgiving. No, we are to, as image bearers of God, reflect that to God who, who is the one who perfectly forgives, right? So whether it's grace, it's mercy, or it's uh, anger towards injustices, whatever it is, we are to reflect others to God 
and show others who he really is. You see, where we fail in these areas, we paint a poor picture of who God really is. Now, we won't work them out perfectly. We know that. We are flawed. And again, that, that mirror uh, to reflect the image of God is, is still kind of broken, and, and God's still at work trying to put those pieces together, that sanctification. And, and it's going to happen someday when we're like Jesus, right? When, when we're with him, that, that mirror will be there all together. But we are to make that attempt. We are to, to strive to show these characteristics in our lives. God is also at work in you to make you more like Christ, where one day you will perfectly reflect his image. So just in conclusion, folks, here this morning, know this, that you are, if you are a child of God, you have great worth, value, and you're dearly loved by your Father in heaven. You're one of his children. And we see this at the cross. You see that the ultimate picture of our value as being made in the image of God is seen at the cross. Okay, So let's fixate ourselves on that. May, may that demonstration of God's love for you and his value for you drown out any other kind of voices that you're hearing. I don't care what the media is saying. I don't care what a, a coworker who's nasty to you says about you, any kind of unkind, hateful words. May God's love and value for you drown those out. May it be a voice that is heard louder than those other voices. So maybe you have confusion about your identity, who you are, and, and, and what you're to do in this life and purpose. Again, look to the God who's created you and created you in his own image. And let's reflect him with our lives. Value, value yourself and others around you as being made in the image of God. And I'll end with this. Maybe for you, that, that mirror in your life is still absolutely shattered. Maybe you don't know Christ. Maybe uh, you know hearing about uh, your value before God is something uh, new to you here this morning. I, I want to talk with you. We have deacons that would be willing and ready to counsel. I know that in a room this size, there are people that still don't know Christ. And so our prayer as a church and leadership is that God would do such a work in your life, that he would reveal your sin before a holy God, knowing that you have been separated. When sin entered the world, we fractured that, that mirror no longer... Uh, reflecting the image of God, but God has had a plan all along to restore you, to bring you back to himself. Uh, I'll be at the door. Feel free to stop and talk to me uh, at some point, uh, if you so wish. Uh, we'll have the, the praise team come up uh, now as I uh, just close up here uh, in a quick word of prayer. Father God, I thank you this morning for your goodness to us. Lord, that you have set us above the rest of your creation. Lord, we look around the world, and it's absolutely beautiful. Lord, we see your fingerprints everywhere. But God, you created us above all those things. Lord, you created us in your own image, in your likeness. Father, where sin has shattered that, you have provided a Savior to mend that back together. And so, Lord, we, we just claim our brokenness before you. Lord, I'm not perfect. No one in this room is but we know the one who is our perfection, the Lord Jesus Christ. And God, if there are any here this morning that, that don't know you, Lord, I pray that your spirit would just do such a movement in their hearts, Lord, that you would humble them and convict them, change their heart of stone to a heart of flesh. God, open their eyes to the truth. May their dead spirit come alive. May you regenerate them, and may you let them see their need of a Savior. And so, God, just please do that work in the unsaved here this morning. God, I pray for the Christian. Lord, where uh, we fail in these areas to, to unconditionally love or to forgive or show grace, Lord, we paint an inaccurate picture of you. And so, God, may you just humble us in these points in our lives, and may we live these out in such a way, God, that will paint an accurate picture of who you really are. God, we thank you for, for who you are, God, and just uh, your, your beauty before us. Lord, we thank you for your son, the Lord Jesus, and it's in his name we pray.